Right, we're we're going to get started. Thank you guys for being here tonight. You're in for a great class. Um, so just like a couple of announcements. Uh, so the first is, uh, if you haven't got it yet, there's a Joshua worksheet up here at the front. Um, and that's going to be your first, uh, the first assignment where you'll be kind of on your own. I uh, posted a link for the class on College Office. And um, you're just going to watch the class and, and fill out the sheet. Um, and then there's like a little part at the bottom, you know, with how it, how it spoke to you. Um, so let me know. Please, please send me an email if you aren't able to get access through College Office. Um, but it should just be a link, and you click it, and it should just take you right, right there. It's on a, on a Google Drive. And uh, that worksheet is due one week from tonight. Uh, the second thing is uh, outreach. So if you look at your syllabus, uh, outreach is a part of your grade for this class. And the way that we're going to do that is uh, next week's journal uh, assignment is going to have a, a little part on there for you to fill out a log of your outreach activity. So um, if you can, uh, this week, uh, if you can find an outreach, uh, if you don't have an outreach right now, uh, please come on Saturday at 9.30 uh, down at the Fellowship Hall. You'll see cars out front, so you shouldn't, shouldn't miss it. Um, but uh, come on down, and there's teams that are going to all over the city um, and if you know if you're looking for an outreach, a way to a way to share your faith, a way to sh uh, a way to share the gospel, um, you can come on Saturday or go go out during the week. Go with your church if this isn't your home church, and your home church has a, uh, an outreach to the community where they you know they share the gospel. Then um, then you can also that can be that can be you can get credit for that outreach activity. So. Um, yeah, I think that was it. Um, oh, I just wanted to, to share a verse. Maybe, um, maybe some new students have it, haven't heard this verse, but it's, um, really just the, the heartbeat of the ministry, the greater grace ministry and the heartbeat of, uh, this Bible college, um, and it's with, uh, in reference to outreach, it's Proverbs chapter 11, verse 30. And it says, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that wins souls is wise. And uh, specifically the B part of that verse, just to focus on that for 30 seconds, <laughs> um, that you know, you as Bible college students are taking in, you know, knowledge, you're taking in Bible doctrine, you're receiving from God. And as a part of that, you know, we, like you are given such a, a wonderful opportunity before God to apply that knowledge in your life. And one of the greatest ways to do that is to go out and share your faith, talk to people that maybe have no concept of God, no concept of the Bible, and you are able to be there as an ambassador for Christ, and you can win people to Christ. I mean, God, God does the winning. You can, you can balance that, but you are there. You are available. You are letting God speak through you, and um, it's just a, a, beautiful, uh, it's a beautiful experience if you, haven't been, if you haven't been on outreach before. So... Um, like I said, please, uh, if you want to come on outreach, uh, you just want to see what it's all about, 9.30 uh, down at the end of the plaza at the Fellowship Hall on Saturdays. Um, yeah, just how important it is for, for you know, you as students and really as any, as any believer in Christ, not just to know, you know, what we believe, but really, like, why we believe it like when we apply it to our lives, when we mix faith with what we've learned, like it's, pro it's profitable for us. And, um, and outreach is just a huge, a huge part of that. 
Okay. Um, so we have an awesome uh, message from Pastor Stevens, 1994. Uh, it's called A New Standard for Living. Uh, pay attention because, um, you know, he really, uh, you know, he makes some very, uh, some very good points about, you know, Satan's plan for our lives versus God's plan and will for our lives. Uh, but there are also little, um, you know, little nuggets of truth kind of like interspersed throughout the, uh, this message. Um, and if you can catch them, um, that in they're, they're life changing. They really are. Um, so Cody, if, if you can start the video. Father, bless this portion in Jesus' precious name. Amen. You may be seated. I believe at the close of the service, there is someone who has cancer that wanted to be prayed for. I'll make sure we pray up front for this person this morning. If you'll give me your undivided attention, I'll get you out in decent time. There's always a question what decent time means to some people. But I'd like to speak to complement the message that has been just given. A message on the new standard for living. The new standard for living. The Word of God says, The thief Satan comes to steal. Then he robs he kills and he destroys. Let that sink deeply into our hearts. Satan comes to steal, to make sick, to rob us of health, to rob us of values, to rob us of happiness, to rob us of wisdom, to rob us of being successful on our jobs, and then he, his second program is to kill our capacity, to kill our health, to kill our aspirations, our dreams, our faith visions, our faith expectations. And the next thing he does is to destroy, and the word destroy there means so that we will not have a capacity for change. so we will not have a capacity for change. I have counseled many people, and I don't know what to do. Not recently, but they want to be counseled, but they don't have a capacity for change. The Word doesn't do that for them. Love doesn't do it for them. Prayer doesn't do it for them. Why? Because Satan has been effective in his deception on his part to steal from them what is God's will to rob and then the second thing he does is kill their capacity and then he destroys any possibility for their change. So then they have to rely on pharmaceutical drugs. They have to rely upon negativity and they don't even admit it. They live in denial. They have flashes of emotional hope, times of verbalizing faith, but I want to say to all of us today, from the bottom of my heart, when I get through with this message, it is so scriptural, biblical, and correct. So that's Satan's entire program, is to steal virtue, to steal emotional health, 
to steal from a good self-image in Christ, to steal from a life of enjoyment, a life of happiness, to rob people of the attributes of faith, to kill people's capacity, and to de destroy people's lives. He is in full-time business doing that. Now watch us now as the Spirit of God takes me into a correlation. Isaiah 55, 7 says, Let the wicked, and the word there is rasha in the Hebrew, and I studied it for a number of minutes to get its depth. It means a person who has been demonized with cosmic infections in his attitude toward God's plan so he never realizes God's purpose, which is eternal. I'll say that again. I'll do it slowly. I'll be very careful and methodical. The Hebrew word is rasha. It means to be demonized with a cosmic attitude toward God's plan so that we never realize God's eternal purpose in our lives. Now, that may infect us in many different ways. For example, because of this, you may never take drugs, but some will. Because of this, you'll never become an alcoholic, but some will. You may never commit immorality, but some will. But you will forsake God's way, deny God's truth, and live in a biological or bios life. You will do that, whatever that may mean for your life. Now, the moment this infection comes, this is what takes place. When somebody steals something, that means you live without it. When somebody robs you, it means something that you're now missing. When somebody kills, it means it isn't there anymore. It's gone. And when somebody destroys, it means totally, absolutely, no capacity. The other things had to happen first. Let the infected one, as it has been defined this morning, forsake the Hebrew word rub, R-O-B. Forsake this way of his infection. This way where he's been the effect of a satanic series of causes. Let him forsake it. Then it uses a very unique word and let the unrighteous man forsake his way, let the infected one forsake his thought. Now, the unrighteous here is very different. It means somebody that because of emptiness has taken on a different attitude because of emptiness. And the attitude is without God's standard of grace, God's standard of power in their life. The unrighteous man then here in this passage is a person who is unable to receive from God because of the destruction and damage done to the soul. So far am I going slowly and are you understanding? All right. Then it says, let him return unto the Lord. It's just simply in the bankruptcy of poverty, spiritually, let him return. To return means he's been there once. He's returning to something he has had. Maybe he didn't have it long, but he has had it. So let him or her return unto God, Son, to be the Lord through the Spirit and the Word. Then there's a very beautiful principle. And the Lord will show, here's what the Hebrew says, unconditional love 
eternal mercy, heavenly compassion, divine pity. These are the words in the Hebrew for the word abundant. Then it says, pardon. And here's what it means. When that person returns, God keeps revealing a flow of love and mercy and forgiveness and healing. And it's like a stream that picks up momentum. And, and the flow keeps increasing and 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 increasing. And the only thing that the Lord asks for is the person receives it and keeps on receiving no matter what has been done or what goes on in their life. It isn't just that God pardoned me yesterday. I am now the object of this flow. And the word abundant means intensification of development. It means increase in the flow. And that is a magnificent thing. It took two hours just to get that in the ancient writings. Imagine, just one little thing. To tell you that much, it took me an hour and 50 minutes. Not to accept just what commentaries say. But to me that is beautiful. Every child of God that returns to the Lord and believes he's the Lord over sin, the Lord over death, the Lord of grace, the Lord of mercy, the Lord of righteousness, the Lord of love, the Lord over faith, and everyone that returns over to his supremacy, the one that has supreme command over Satan and gives us something special for a new standard of life. Now, Jesus said, okay, Satan comes to steal and with it he robs and then he comes to kill and then he comes to destroy so that you don't have a capacity to receive. And God's plan is rejected because of frustrations in the circumstances of the details of life so that you never realize God's eternal purpose in the situation that is at hand. There's no purpose in it for you except frustration how many understand it? All right. Second Corinthians 1 8. I'm going to give you the application in the Greek without going into the words. Paul said, Dear folks, in the midst of your tribulation, in the midst of your poverty, in the midst of your heartache and pain, you have given out of an abundant, overflowing heart of generosity. You've gone beyond the reality of sight. Everything's wrong with you folks. But he said, physically, you know, physically, you're not healthy. You've got tribulation, you're being persecuted. But he said, you never thought a second thought. From the abundance of love and faith, you've given to help others. Amazing verse. Incredible. Jesus said, I have come that you might not only have life and the most incredible words in the entire book of John for practical application for a Christian is that you have it more abundantly. And he said, I want to contrast that with what Satan's doing. I want to contrast it with why I came. I have forgiven you abundantly. That means way beyond anything you can ever know, by the way. I paid for your sins way beyond anything you'll ever experience. You'll never down here be able to experience because of your capacity the depth of what it means to be forgiven. Unless you let this abundant life flow in you. 
He said, I've come. The words more abundantly are so unique. Now, abundantly is inexhaustible, overflowing, incomprehensible, unfathomable, but now he puts more in front of it. He said, you mark it down. I want you to have life beyond anything you've ever known or experiences or have knowledge of through the scriptures. I was thinking of Mr. Henderson this morning whose wife left him. His wife left him and ran out on him because Mr. Henderson came down with a Parkinson disease at a very young age. And she just didn't like it. For better, for worse, didn't mean that to Miss, Mrs. Henderson. And she left him. And I went to his house four times a week between 2 and 2.30 and prayed with him every day because he was so heartbroken. And I gave him everything I could to read of men of God and anything I could say to him. And he turned it into a magnificent, life. And Mr. Henderson went out every day from three to five to knock on doors. He was shaking alone, on his own. And he brought, within a year, he brought 28 people in our church single-handed. And he just was always bubbling with joy. Shaking, but bubbling. And the second year in a healing service on a Sunday night, of his salvation, he got gloriously healed, supernaturally. I was thinking, however, of Ralph Montanus, who stayed in our home, who shared with us, you've heard of him out of New Jersey and Brooklyn, the blind evangelist that has reached millions or thousands of people through Braille, starting a Braille ministry. And he said, I went to Oral Roberts, I went to everybody under the sun when I was told I was going to be blind. And he said, I would take my little children in my arms and just stare at them, knowing that I would never see them again. And I could not get grace to be blind. And I'd go out with my wife and stare at her and watch the sun set. And then we'd get up the next morning and watch it rise. And I kept doing that. I couldn't see God's purpose. I didn't have a capacity to receive this providential act of God while I went to them and prayed I was not living in sin everything was seemingly great but here's the blindness I began to shake people's hands and couldn't see the hand anymore except a shadow and then Ralph Montanus became blind God didn't answer his prayer like he did Mr. Henderson but today, he has the most fantastic, unbelievable Braille ministry. And it is recorded that last year, 290,000 accepted Christ through Braille and are being discipled by his Braille material. The last time I saw him, he smiled and he said, Oh, do I understand God's purpose now to think God had to do this to me because I wouldn't have gone into a Braille ministry. And he said, now, by the grace of God, he said, hundreds and thousands are getting saved and going into the Bible in Braille and becoming happy and peaceful and joyous in that world that cannot see the sunrise. Do you know, see, God's plan for him was only to reach them and it would mean he, him to lay down his life. Deuteronomy 30 and verse 9 to Israel, God wanted them to prosper with the fruit of their hands and the work of their body. That was the part of the abundant life for them to prosper. In Deuteronomy 33, 13 through 16, pertaining to Joseph, the word of God says, God wants to bless those people and their land through nature, through the sun shining properly, through the rains coming properly, through the right soil. And God says, I want to bless you by blessing nature just for you. And 
in 2 Corinthians 1.8, in the crowd that were having, they were having tribulation. He wanted to bless their mind and their emotions beyond imagination. But in 3 John 2, and I believe this with all my heart, and I'm not going to balance it today because I've spent years telling you I balance. So let's just stick to the point today. You know my balance. But God wants our physical body to be healthy even as our soul prospers. I am absolutely sure he wants me to have amazing health. Unless, and if he doesn't, the only reason would be for something like Montanus, not the other reasons. God doesn't get any joy out of people lying in bed sick. Unless they've got a worldwide, unless they've got a tremendous ministry or they're going to identify in the future with people like they never had before or they're ministering to angels while they're sick. But I don't think that's supposed to be for years. That would only be for a short season if you study 1 Peter 6, 7, and 8 properly. So the first thing that we've got to understand, what is God's will toward his children? The second thing... What is Satan's will and what is he doing to confuse God's children? And the third thing it is, how to have a new standard of life to experience what God provides and promises for his children. I know some things that are not for people that are sick. Miserable. Satan is going to be told off this morning. Satan, you will not steal and rob and kill and destroy people's emotions, marriage, mind, body, health, financial needs. You're not going to do it because I'm defining it and we love God and we're going to accept the abundant life. Now here's where it starts. In him, Jesus Christ, we have redemption. Ephesians 1, 7. The forgiveness of sins according to his wealth and riches of grace. Now I'm not, I'm not going to hurry over that. You see, this is one thing I'm going to tell preachers tomorrow morning. Don't be so concerned about preaching your message. Let God teach you you may not even say half of the things. Let it flow out of you so he'll, because you're well studied, let it flow out of you so you even get blessed out of your orbit because it's his message to you as well as them. So here's the way it goes. In him we have, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins, but according to the wealth and riches of God's grace. Now wealth and riches, two beautiful words. God is wealthy in giving out grace. You could never begin to subtract a single inch of God's grace because of his wealth through the redemption and forgiveness toward believers. I mean, he treats us after the wealth of his grace, the riches of his provision. Don't you feel he's some little God that just can't give you much more? You're wrong. You, you can't tap it in this lifetime. You can't even understand it nor give a definition to it. This is why the Lord said in the chapter that deals with the gifts, in 1 Corinthians 12, 31b, I'm going to show you, he said, a way where my life overflows in the excellence of superabundance through love. And I want that superabundance love be a way for you and not the emphasis on the gifts. Quite interesting. In Ephesians 3, Paul's second prayer to the church at Ephesus, he says that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith that you may be rooted and grounded in an overflowing, excelling, incomprehensible love and receive it for yourself. Because the word unrighteous in Isaiah 55, 7 means you trouble yourself through a wrong attitude, then you trouble others. That's what it means. You're troubled because of a wrong attitude. 
then you trouble others you can't receive because of a defense mechanism. Now watch this carefully. That Christ may dwell in your heart by faith, that you may be rooted and grounded in love, that you may be able to understand how to possess and experience God's love into a new length and breadth and depth and height. Now that means, doesn't mean just length, breadth, depth. It means beyond anything you know or beyond anything you've ever experienced through a faith walk. Then verse 19, and to know this supernatural abounding love and to be filled with all the fullness of God and unto him that is able to do exceedingly above what we ask, present middle indicative, or what we think, present active indicative. Kata, K-A-T-A, according to the standard of the power of God that worketh in you. Now here's the key to this message. And it's precious. God says, I want you to experience something way beyond your knowledge about life. I want you to experience something way beyond you've ever seen. See, we judge what's going to happen by what we've experienced and what we already know. And that conditions us to an incapacitation of receptivity toward this wealth of God's riches in love. We're so natural, though we believe in the supernatural, we almost don't dare to believe in it because of our past experiences. Now I'm going to say this again very, very slowly. The new standard of life for the object of grace for the subject of love and the grandeur of mercy is this. I want you to know beyond the length of this universe, beyond the depth of your scientific grasp, beyond the width of your intelligence, beyond the height of what you see with your eyes, I want you to know beyond those four dimensions on earth the love of God. God, which passes by all the knowledge of everything you have and know in the secular world, in the spiritual world, and to be filled with all this plenteous of grace, plenteous of mercy, plenteous of love, to be filled with all the fullness of God. And to know that he is able to give you beyond what you present tense, middle, the subject produces the action, middle voice, indicative, dogmatic. I direct middle, you receive the action of it. I want you to act in faith toward love, toward the wealth of grace, toward the grandeur of mercy. And to know he's able to go way beyond what you've asked. Forget what you've asked. It's a new world with God. Way beyond what you think. Way beyond anything you've experienced. Way beyond anything you can talk about around the table. But it will be according to the standard of the power of grace and love and mercy that you receive for nothing and works in you through faith. And unto him be glory in the church throughout all the ages, world without end. Bill Ryder, a friend of mine, came to our church, did well for three years, backslid, 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 drugs, everything. 
we drove 27 miles and saw him from a bar room. He was in a bar room. This is what he said. He was drinking over excessively. And he said, he was at this bar room in Portland. He said, I know somebody that still loves me. I'm going to call him. He went to pay phone. He called me and I happened to be home. He said, I know somebody that loves me. I can't go on anymore. It's my second year and a half of back, so I just hate this. We drove down, two of us drove down to Portland, brought him home. He's with the New Tribes Missions as a missionary today. You know what he said? I know somebody that loves me. And all that is is receiving and giving what I got. No man gets credit for anything. It's just thank God when you receive and just say you can have it too. And then he keeps getting filled. Perhaps you saw on TV the seven boys in Kentucky, a small town. They didn't drink. They didn't smoke. They were teenagers. They all went to the same school. They played sports. They worked at the same place. They were wonderful kids. Their eighth friend didn't go with them because he didn't have money. They were at their jobs. They were going out for half an hour lunch break. And got into an accident. All seven died. In their van, all seven died. Nobody can figure it out down there because they didn't drink, didn't smoke. They were sweethearts of kids. They were just going for their lunch break. And the eighth guy that's so close to them said, I guess if I had known that was going to happen, I miss him so much, I would like to be with him. But the unexpected takes place so quickly. Teenagers, good teenagers, wonderful teenagers, models for teenage people. In five minutes from the time they left their place of business, they're all gone. Why did that happen? I don't know. Neither do you. But I know this. God's way is perfect in Psalm 18.30. I know that he does everything perfectly in Deuteronomy 33.4. And I know that was his purpose because those were wonderful kids. That I know. So we rest the case. See? They're in heaven. We rest the case. Now. I'm going to close this very quickly, but think of it. Satan comes to steal, and with it, rob. Rob me of forgiveness, forgiving others. Rob me of happiness, to rob us of joy, to rob us of getting the benefits of nature, to rob us of prospering, whatever that means, it's, it's real. To rob us of good health, to rob us of good relationships, of a good mind and a good emotions and happy expectations from God. And then he tries to kill... Any desire we have for the supernatural. And then he destroys our capacity so we can't come back. But God says, return and I will intensify mercy, intensify love, intensify grace. It'll be a little stream. It'll flow bigger and bigger towards you, towards you, because that's who I am. And I'll give you the wealth of my love, the wealth of my grace, the wealth of my compassion. And you can't even touch it. Why, after 5,000 have had the five loaves and fishes, it'll still be there. Not one thing will be gone. And he says, if you be rooted and grounded in love and exercise faith, you'll know beyond any dimensions of time. And he said, you will know this love which goes beyond knowledge by personal experience. You'll be filled with it consistently. And the new standard for your provision and your prayers and your joy and by the way, abundant joy in 2 Corinthians 8, in the midst of difficulty, you'll go way beyond that and have the more excellent thing, keeping you, motivating you, energizing you, stabilizing you, maturing you. And I like Ephesians 1.8, and with this I'm closing. He will abound towards you with supernatural knowledge, supernatural wisdom and supernatural prudence but there prudence means experience in that knowledge no it doesn't 
It means divinely speaking, going beyond the knowledge. Would you bow your heads? Wow, wasn't that good? <laughs> um, so we have a few minutes left in the the time that we have together. Um, so what I, I kind of want to get you guys to process this a little bit. Um, so he ended he ended with a portion at the end of Ephesians chapter three, um, and what I'd like you guys to do, if you can, uh, either with your neighbors or with a, gr a group near you. Um, is just to read uh, that that portion, specifically verses uh, 18 through 20, and just talk about you know talk about what he talked what he said about that, and also um, you know how that's so different from what he talked about at the beginning of class um, in John chapter 10, where the devil loves to steal and kill and destroy. So if we can take about five minutes um, and just get in groups or talk to your neighbor. Um, it's, uh, Ephesians chapter 3, verses 18 and 20. Just read those and, compa and compare them to John chapter 10, verse 10, okay?
Okay, guys. Um, so uh, this is the <laughs> the end of the of our time. Um, so just uh, to recap, um, the Joshua assignment is up here. If you haven't grabbed it yet, um, I've posted the audio online, so um, you can go there and listen to it and fill out the sheet. Um, if you have any access issues, please email me. And um, awesome. So let's let's pray to close out. Father, thank you. Father, thank you for Pastor Stevens and his life, his ministry of the word, and uh, help what we receive tonight to become personal for us, God, personalize it in our hearts. And we just ask, Father, that you'd bless us now as we go and bless the remaining classes tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.